We have myself, Teresa Heim, CEO of Behavioral Health Care Part. I didn't say that, Leanne. Um, it's Behavioral Health Building Solutions. I said Behavioral Health Care Partners. And going back 10 years. Um, anyway, we have Teresa Lample from Ohio Council. We have Chris Smalley, Smalley & Associates. We have Sonda Kunze, Coding Advantage. Todd Cheris, Qualifax. And Chris Wolf, TIL Consulting and an executive at Connect Voice, which just, by the way, is a software that integrates with other electronic health records for the DD market. So uh, he's got a little interesting aspect that, that goes into his background. So let's go ahead and get started. So don't forget about Gary. Not sure how to do this. Oh, Gary. Where's Gary? Gary. Can we bring up Gary? Yeah. Okay. Can we view Gary? Okay, we have Gary Humble from Pinnacle Partners. He lost his internet today. He was supposed to be on the screen, but we do have him, we believe, on the phone. Gary, can you say hello? Okay, we may have issues with Gary, but um, just so you know, I will make sure that if we can't hear Gary, that we will make sure that we get his information out. Gary is a Pinnacle Partner, he is the executive director of Pinnacle Partners, known Gary for 10, 11 years, seen him do amazing things with contracting and credentialing, and um, kind of my guru when it comes to that area. So anyway, um, not sure how to start this. I guess we could start. Uh, we answered the first two questions. We can't answer, and I'm, I'm sure... Any MCO want to answer what services will require a prior auth after July? Yeah, I didn't think so. <laughs> My guess is nobody knows yet. I think that's going to be yet to be determined. Um, hopefully, we'll stay within the realm of where we are. Yes? So, Teresa, I can't say definitive, but I'll say the two that seem to be most looked at uh, for changes are uh, one that doesn't require prior authorization at all right now, which is your drug testing, your drug screening. So I don't think it's any secret uh, that managed care plans, the state providers, provider organizations, everyone's looking at your drug screening, your drug testing, and what that might look like in the future. And I think SUV Residential is another one that's on the collective radar of managed care plans and the prior authorization processes around that as well. So okay. Definitive, but those are the two, I would say Urine drug screens? Really? What's that? Urine drug screens? You have no idea. They're $14. You know, <laughs> sure. They, just saying. <laughs> Okay, no, I appreciate the honesty. Can I? Yeah, yes. So, yes. So the question was, and, and John Nitsky from CareSource responded to things that might be looked at for prior authorization moving beyond July. And the two services he mentioned are urine drug screen, which um, for those of you who are in the SUD business, no, we've spent a lot of time talking about P. <laughs> I do not want to tell you how many hours I have spent talking about urine drug screens. Never enough, never enough. Never <laughs> enough. The issue is not the H code that you're billing for the, the, the dip, for the, or for the, um, for the, 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 initial, the initial screen. The issue is when you're doing confirmatory and definitive testing and how much of that is medically necessary and how that looks. And we have, um, we have great differences of opinion as to where this should land. And I think that's something that we'll have to work through. Um, CareSource had a very restrictive policy. They've moved that back. Um, so we've already seen some work on that. The other service that John mentioned is SUD residential. Um, I think that is also um, I would expect that to happen. That I will see. I do anticipate a change, especially if Ohio moves forward with an 1115 waiver. For those of you doing res SUD residential, there is currently an 1115 waiver posted um, for review and public comment through November 25th. Um, if you are doing that service, you should be taking a look at what that waiver says um, and being prepared to make comments on that. Essentially, what's happening is the state of Ohio will be requesting. Um, uh, authority, um, financial authority to continue to pay for residential treatment services. So 
I'm not prepared to say anything more than that. I think you need to take a look at that waiver, but I do think those are two services that, yes, there's always been a lot of ongoing conversation around. I should have went so far. Okay. We're going to get the MCOs out of the way, the questions. Um, are there federal guidelines of the minimum dollar amount the MCOs can ne negotiate for services come July 2019? Anybody? What does that mean? Yes. Who asked the question? <laughs> okay. Well, I'm asking for what's, what's the floor? Is there what we understand? So the reason I was asking, so for what we understand is that once the negotiating processes start uh, happening for uh, the fee for service, is that uh, there has to be some kind of guidelines of what is the minimum that you guys can offer for a service that agency <clears throat> that is agency is providing. So I'm trying to get an idea so we can have some type of idea of uh, financial forecasting of where we should be looking at. It's a fair question. Um, does anybody? Yeah, my guess is they're not there yet. Hang on. Hang on. Basically, I'm asking, is there contract an evergreen contract? Does it renew every year, or does it have to be renegotiated? Uh, our contracts at Buckeye are evergreen, unless you come back to us and want to renegotiate those contracts. Uh, so it would continue into the next year continually. So what you're contracted at today would be what you're contracted at for next year as well. We generally don't do that. Um, there are some times where there are things that come up like that, but it's not something that's a normal practice. Okay. Um, what time frame do MCOs envision getting with agencies to negotiate contracts and rates? Now, is this something that is MCO driven or agency driven? So, if, if I'm an agency, and I don't know why this sounds weird, maybe I'm, yeah, it's like, oh. Um, if I'm an agency and I'm contracted with you, but, well, wait a minute, let me look at the question. So are you going to reach out with, to, well, you're not, we know what you're doing with the Evergreen thing, right? Generally. No. Generally. But the other MCOs, from that perspective, I mean, are you going to reach out to the agencies and say, okay, this is what our contracting is going to look like in, you know, for July? Or is that something the agencies should be responsible for? There's just contracts for Evergreen as well. So. That's good news, John. <laughs> Paramount, also Evergreen. Where's United? Uh-oh. We missed one. Okay, and uh, who am I missing? Melina. All right, we'll get that answer later. Appreciate the information. You need to let me through. Sorry. All right, so um, I think a couple different people can speak to. Uh, standards say that a client re can receive residential care, care per diem as well as a visit to a prescribing medical provider off-site. However, and Teresa and I were talking about this during lunch, so I know she can speak to it. It's problematic at, at the moment, but I'll give it to her. You can say the same thing you told me. <laughs> so I'm going to read because, you know, I don't go anywhere without my rules package if, if you know, that's just who I am. Um, so I brought it with me. Um, this is found in the Medicaid rule. It is 5160-2709, which is the SUD service. It's paragraph C. It says, individuals in residential treatment may receive medically necessary services from practitioners that are not affiliated with the residential treatment program. Not affiliated with the residential treatment program. Examples include, but are not limited to, psychiatry, medication-assisted treatment, or other medical treatment that is outside the scope of the residential level of care as identified by ASAM. 
Medicaid will reimburse providers of these services outside the per diem rate paid to the residential treatment program. All treatment services, regardless of whether they are rendered by the residential program or unaffiliated billing practitioners or agencies, must be documented in the client's treatment plan. So the issue is, is in it, and this was intentional, this was a lot of effort um, to get this language clear and stated in the rule. So for example, if, you're res if you have a client who sees their primary care provider, they're not affiliated with your agency, both services should be paid. The, where, the, where we have run into issues is if you have psychiatry and it's provided under your provider type 84, so it's not affiliated with the program. And I wanna be clear, the language says not affiliated with the residential treatment program. It does not say agency. That was deliberate, that was intentional. So it is our understanding that the intent here was to allow for psychiatry appointments because this, the rate of the psychiatrist in how they put together the actuarial rate structure for residential treatment, psychiatry was not included. It was not factored in, so it is separate. I will tell you that MITS is not structured in compliance with the rule. This has been brought up. It will continue to be brought up, but it is, the rule is very clear. The rule says it should be co it's covered. This is the only guidance we have is what is in the rule. But what you have is in the administra is in the Ohio Administrative Code. So what is our what is our fallback? I mean, because we're getting denials all over the place. I mean, mm -hmm. So we have to continue to push this through and um, you know raise the issues with the Department of Medicaid all the way to the director. I will tell you I'm not certain that we're going to get any change in this in the next 60 days. Give me 90 days and we have a new Medicaid director, maybe, but we're gonna be in a transition period. I think this is where it's important and we can all work together to say, this is what the administrative code says. The administrative code says it's payable. The administrative code says it's covered. And unless the Department of Medicaid wants to make a rule change, it's covered. I don't know if anybody else has anything. Ditto. <laughs> so anytime you're appealing these, I think you point to this section. You know, that's the point. If you can appeal through the managed care plans, and I'm not put, intentionally putting the plans on the spot, but this is a clarification that this is what the administrative rule says. And maybe they can help us get a, get a resolution to this issue. Sure. It is 5160-2709. Paragraph C. Um, Kenny, can you still make sure United Healthcare and Molina come in? Please. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, sorry. We have one for Todd on Qualifax EM notes. When I see the, the ICD. I'm assuming 10 codes are searched for and then entered. Will that provide MCO plans direct information on the complexity of the patient? That is a very good question. I don't know that I know that level of detail, but I will get you an answer if you will get with me. Okay. Um, I believe that it's going to depend on how your clinical staff is setting up their treatment plan you know, you have to add that level of complexity that Teresa was referring to earlier. Now, I was telling Teresa during lunch, I've had denials from Medicaid because it, had, it was an SUD service, two SUD diagnosis code, a mental health in pointer four, and they denied it for that mental health. That's an inappropriate denial. However, they did it. So, now this was Medicaid. This wasn't even an MCO. So, it was pre that. Um, we have United Healthcare now? Okay. We have United Healthcare is denying claims for timely filing after 90 days. Is there anything that states that the the 180 day rule that we can refer to them them to contest these denials? <coughs> Hang on. Okay, so it was an error. All right. 
Okay. So, you know, if anybody's experienced that problem with United Healthcare in particular, I also know that we had an initial issue with um, a prior authorization being required for SUD group, SUD case management, IOP. None of those services require it. My recommendation is that you hook up with her before you leave today. Give her a card. That's what I've been doing is, you know, making sure that as I see these, they're identified with the plans. <clears throat> Okay, how often do treatment plans need to be updated? We can talk to Sonda on this one. Sonda or Chris? I was going to say, maybe even Teresa. You know, because I'm going to refer to OAC. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to look that up. But I feel like, well, just I'll give you my opinion, my two cents, whether it's worth in terms of clinical, probably not much. But it should be a living, breathing document and be updated as often as it needs to be in order to meet the needs of the patient, right? But I, I, there might be an OAC that says a minimum. I'm feeling like a year can't be more than a year, but anybody else on that? Although I'll go back to should be a living, breathing document. Okay. <laughs> okay. So I have the citation in front of me because I have my rules. Um, <laughs> although I knew this one, yes. it, the, for Medicaid billing, and this is where it is consistent with the MHAS certification rule. For Medicaid billing, it's in 5160.805. It's in paragraph F, which is where the documentation language is, and it's 1B. So the treatment plan has to be completed within five sessions or one month, whichever is longer, and it must be updated at least annually or when clinically indicated. As I indicated earlier, that's for your treatment services. If you are doing SUD case management, the treatment plan has to be updated every 90 days. If I could just add that if you're looking at your clinical documentation and the meetings that I've had on the phone with some of the MCO providers, if you're looking at your documentation, um, it's going to look much more individualized if you're updating it, like Sonda said, as your client needs it, not just on that timeline. Oh, it's, it's 90 days. We're at 79 days. We better update that treatment plan. That's not looking like it's a very individualized service. Um, just to reemphasize, and I don't remember if this was an individual conversation. I think it was. Um, but I just wanted to mention one of the questions I had earlier was somebody that's an SUD does SUD residential, and you know technically the first 30 days you don't need an auth. They break treatment. They should be able to come back for the second 30 days, right? And on the third one, they need a prior auth. The issue is we're now in November. When do, when does the calendar year start for that? January? The fiscal year, so it's July. Okay. Well, if it's July, then we're only halfway calendar. through. It's so, calendar, yeah. Oh, it's calendar year. Okay. So, you know, but, yeah, at this point in the year, there's a lot of people that go into treatment. They, they get out of treatment. They go back to treatment. They're at that prior auth stage. My recommendation, start that prior auth process as they come in the door. Because at this point, there's no way you're not going to know that, you know, the client went to community for new directions yesterday, and today is at Samaritan. So you're just not going to know. There's no way for us to know that. Client may not tell you that. My recommendation would be to get the prior off. At least get the, get the process started. I mean, they may, not, they may tell you you don't need it yet. That's cool. Put it in place for when, it, when, it, when I do. Anyway. Okay, questions. Do we have any more? Okay. <laughs> Wow, it's all MCOs. Why don't, we're, we're going to give you our table. No, I'm just kidding. Um, let's see. Our state rep said only three agencies let them know, and it wasn't enough. We need all agencies calling. No one else will do this. I don't know what that means. Sound like a question. Um, well, I think it's a statement, and I do believe that, you know, at this point, at BHBS, we work with 25 to 30 agencies, and it's growing about two or three clients a week. So we try to help as many as we can. Um, the big thing is, I stress to all of my clients reach out to legislators. 
make your voice known. You know, Ohio Council, BHBS, we can't do it all. We need people to stand up and say, this hurts. I'm going to go out of business. I've got two payrolls left. That's what they need to hear right now. And, you know, at this point in the game, if we don't have a cash plan within the next 30 to 60 days, we've already lost agencies. We're going to lose more. And that means those, those clients don't have access to care. So I'm assuming that's what that, that question means. Um, okay, so I think we already answered. We believe it is January to December, right, for, for prior auth. Yeah, it's a calendar. I'm okay. pretty sure that's in the manual. Okay. Um, what do you, uh, this one, uh, QM, I'm assuming that's QMHS. Um, taxonomy code should be for a behavioral health technician or case manager. Now, yeah, yeah. So I know that Medicaid did one good thing on that document they sent out about registering all providers. I mean, the, the unlicensed, the complexity is just insane. But they did actually put applicable taxonomy codes for QMHS and CMS. Now, we can send that out so you have it. Um, you know, it, initially, they told us point blank, we're not going to tell you. So, you know, I, I was really tickled when I saw it. I'm like, wow, they said something. So, you know, it kind of worked. But, you know, it, it was one of those things. Nobody knows how to, how to do it. Teresa, do you have any input on that? <coughs> She's looking through her book. But, and let's see. Are any providers get, getting paid the correct rate for CPST by UHC? <laughs> Sorry. Um, I mean, I, I, haven't, I haven't seen many problems with CPST. Um, there is? Okay, apparently there is an issue. Um, my guess is then it's been reported. I personally haven't seen it with any of our agencies. We have a lot of SUD agencies that, that you know, have a very small population of mental health. So I think our bigger problem is with the mental health nursing and the requirements around that, as well as the mental health day treatment and getting people to understand. When you, you know, somebody mentioned the modifiers for mental health. When you think about, and this is what I tell agencies, it was very critical, I think it was Teresa that brought up, it's an HR compliance issue. You have to work with billing. As a new person comes in that door or terms, you need to know their licensure, their education background, you need to make sure their certification is taken care of, you need to have a proof of employment that not only shows proof of employment, shows currently employed, and it's signed by a director at the agency. Can't be a welcome letter. They don't like them. Just saying. So the level of complexity is, is kind of crazy on that point. So. Oh, refreshing. All right. Um, what do you know about how Melina is processing H2020 with modifiers? Denials range from procedure code inconsistent with modifiers used for H2028N, non-covered, um, you know, the non-covered <laughs> provider, uh, usually those seem to be, in what I've dealt with, it's a contract issue. You're not in there, right? But I'll, I'll take it over to her and let her speak to this a little bit. Ah, ah, ah. <laughs> There was an issue. It wasn't really a system issue. There was an issue going on with the H codes in general, H20. It was with the QMHS providers. It wasn't even a modifier issue. And so now we're asking with the rendering providers that if we could get an updated roster. I know many of you have sent that to us, and we have gotten them taken care of. Once it's done, you do not have to resubmit the claims. We're doing those automatically for you and having them reprocessed. Does that answer the question? Um, I just saw one of the questions. Apparently, this is broke. Won't scroll anymore. Um, one of the questions was, uh, when did we start requiring a prior auth for 90791? That began January 1. 
for the second, right. for the second one. So, I mean, that was part of the redesign. It was the switch to the CPT codes that did it. And, and I believe, and Teresa can, or, or somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, but that applies to mental health or SUD. So, you get one. So, that's kind of critical. Correct. Questions? Anybody? Come on. You don't get this opportunity very often. Oh, there's more. Hang on. You get to go. Okay. Thank you. Um, you had talked a little bit about um, uh, the assessment process and how that it can really um, be a 30-day period. Um, and so my question is, is like we have maybe a 10 day access to our doc our doctor. And so if the full assessment process hasn't been completed, can our doctor go in and bill for um, his evaluation and any follow up care? So I think we have to, again, think a little differently around assessment and you have an initial assessment, and I will clarify, if you go to the MHAS rule, it does give you the, quali the requirements that have to be in the initial assessment. So it's, it's presenting problem, it's all the things I mentioned, the one I forgot was um, the risk assessment. So he, suicidality, lethality, which I guess I assume is always present in every appointment, um, given the work that we do and the patient population that we serve. So once you have that, so it, it Part of it is your clinical practice then, how you change and design your clinical practice and what your physician is expecting to have available to him or her or the, the NP. You have an assessment. You have started an episode of care. You are delivering services. You have a working diagnosis. So whether or not you have that complete biopsychosocial and what the expectation is for that particular um, medical practitioner, those are two different things and then in terms of how you're going to design your clinical services to meet that needs. And I will, you know, I've worked with physicians a lot and sometimes they're really, um, it's really difficult to change what they're willing to accept and, and, and expect and change. And in an e and code world, they've already seen their, you know, it's rocked their world in terms of understanding e and code documentation. I know there's lots of discussions going on around, I don't want you doing 30 minute appointments anymore. I need you to do some in 15. And they're saying, can't do. And you've got others saying, I need at least an hour for an assessment. I'm never gonna be willing to do a 30 minute appointment. So these are all of the very complex practice change issues that you have to work through as an organization around setting your clinical leadership and your culture. But at the end of the day, it really has to be about, and what I find, and, and actually even what Dr. Hurst, um, who's the MHAS director right now, said, if you go back to saying, Let's, what can we do that is in the best interest of the patient? That changes the nature of the conversation when you're talking about clinical practice change. Because it really is all of the things I talked about in terms of assessment and being more engagement focused and more customer friendly is about doing what's best for the patient. And our system has been complicated. We've made it harder than it needed to be. And we have in that, and then in turn, we force clients to tell their story over and over and over. And we wonder why they don't want to come back. We have ways now with, the, with some of the flexibilities built into how you code and what you bill and how you think about your services to become drastically more patient friendly. And we have to do that because I, our managed care partners are all expecting access. When you talk to the Department of Medicaid and, talk, and ask them what they're buying when they buy managed care, they're buying access. We have to create, do a better job of creating access. And these are some of the ways I think we can do it. Anyone else comment? Ditto. <laughs> Ditto. Uh, let me do one question that I just sat down. My boots are killing me. Um, so <laughs> Two quick questions, and then I'll run over. My toes should feel better. Uh, does the panel have thoughts about what s contracting will look like 7-1? So this is not to the MCOs. This is to the panel. Contracting. With the MCOs. It, it sounded like they answered that. So, so, yeah, let, me, so, yeah. so let me do a little myth-busting here. I'm going to go back to data that I shared and data that I know Todd reiterated. This is all about value. 
If managed care plans are about the bottom line, what did you hear in our presentations about the impact of the services you provide to their bottom line? You make it better. Back to they're looking to buy access. They know when their patients are involved with your organizations and receiving behavioral health services, their total cost of care is likely to go down. That's good for everybody. In the MyCare Ohio experience, which has been going on since 2015, 14? 14, 2014, I have not seen a single managed care plan that reduced the rates for behavioral health. They're in 29 counties. They are in all of the major metropolitan areas. They are contracting with big providers and small providers. We've not seen a reduction in the network, and we've not seen a reduction in the rates. They get that they need access. If they pay you less, you don't survive. The issues we're having today are because we're having challenges getting claims paid. We're working to fix that. I, I, it's not impossible that we'll see things that change. Here's the other thing. They have requirements in their contract to move 50% of their claims payment to value-based contracting by 2020. Let me repeat that again. 50% of their contracts in value-based payment by 2020. They're going to be approaching you for new arrangements. The challenge we have in, in looking at value-based payment arrangements, none of us have good data. You don't know what your cost per client is. You don't know, back to what Todd was talking about in terms of the variation, who are your high-cost clients, who are your low-cost clients? What's your total cost of care across your population? What are their chronic disease conditions? These are the things you're going to need to know when you're trying to make decisions about value-based payment arrangements. Just moving into, we'll give you a monthly cap rate or a PMPM for certain services, you have to have the data to analyze if what's being offered is good information and gives you the flexibility to serve the patient population. And to do all of those social determinant things that we do well, we undersell and undervalue what we offer in that stream. Those are the things, if when you're talking about primary care, you're talking about cardiovascular disease, you're talking about diabetes, you're talking about all of the chronic conditions that impact our patients that they struggle with. If we can do the social determinant thing, make sure that they have food, that they have stable housing, that they have transportation, that they have all of the things that we know help them get well and stay well, then that's a value add, and you should be considering that when you're thinking about contracts for value. We underrepresent what we do there, but from a fee schedule, from a reducing your contract rates, I haven't seen it happen in my care. When we've had the managed care plans collectively at our policy meetings talking with providers, it's not really something they're considering because they need access and they know what you do reduces the total cost of care. It's a win-win. Anybody else? Yeah, I would only, I think that was very well said, Teresa. Here's what I would say. I didn't give you the punchline in my presentation about the air conditioning. 30% reduction in readmissions. There you go. Managed care was happy to pay for the air conditions, by the way. <laughs> um, I think it is about value, and I think we can start with where we're at. I know it can be a, a very overwhelming when you think about the data sets you have to collect, especially when you're learning that there's new data that maybe you haven't historically collected. But let's just take a look at something like a PHQ-9, and let's assess where it is on the first visit and the second visit and how much it moves, and then what you're specifically doing as an agency in terms of any interventions or any treatments or any best practices that you're implementing to understand how you can continue to make that delta between the first and second visit be something that it's not today. I think all the conversations I've had with managed care companies, if you, if you called a meeting with them and went and sat down and said, let me show you my data about my PHQ-9 and what I'm doing, I think you'd be surprised at how much more collaborative those conversations are. They really do want the same things that everyone in this room wants. The, the challenge is just the data piece that we've been alluding to, and you have it. You have more of it than the payers do. The payers have a broader spectrum of it, but your depth of data is much richer. Okay. Oh. Let me add something to Teresa, since I haven't sure. been able to say much today. I'm at 3 o'clock, for those of you that will stick around for that. Um, I'm the strategic planning guy, for whatever that's worth. Um, what I'd say is everything that's been stated, I've heard for three years now, with regards to what managed care would want and where people should be moving. And if this is news to you, you're well behind the times. 
Um, this is information I think that has been very clear if you've been paying attention. So I apologize, I'm not wagging my finger at anybody, but I'm just saying this has been out there. Um, sitting through this morning and this afternoon, I think it's just important that we're listening to the difference between what's happening in billing, what's happening with coding, and what we talk about with value-based payment. It, it feels like sometimes the conversation is kind of merged. And one of the things hopefully we'll talk about this afternoon, is those are two very separate things. Um, thinking about where you're going with your, with your agency and how you're going to engage your customers, your consumers, is very different than understanding how to code something. They're both incredibly important, so I'm, I'm not dismissing that, but they're different things. I spent a lot of time, and I'll talk about myself in the, at three o'clock to introduce sort of my background, but, but I've been very clever in the way that I've been able to figure out how to do braided funding and things of that nature, and I do help clients with that. Um, but in the end, it's still around strategy and where you're going with your organization and what are you doing strategically to move into this direction where value-based payment is very different than fee-for-service. And I would challenge a lot of you to say that it really is moving from a compliance-based mentality of what do I need to do to get my license, what do I need to do to get paid, um, and really changes how you have to answer that question. It's not compliance anymore. Yes, you'll be audited. Of course, there's compliance. Of course, we're all, you know, licensed. But it's, it's very, very different, and you cannot merge the two. Uh, it, it'll be dangerous for you. So. Okay, Ray, are you still in here? Okay, Ray, does eTactics have the capability to generate reports of denied and or pending claims? Oh, hang on. I got to run all the way out there. Now I thought about it, trust me. It's a bad call. Can you read that for me one more time? <laughs> does eTactics e have the capability to generate reports of denied and or pending claims or pended claims? So, you know, do you have something that basically shows the claim life cycle? <coughs> you sent the claim, here's what I've gotten paid on, here's what I've heard nothing on that kind of reporting? Uh, yes. So from the standpoint of when the claim comes in, we're tracking it, we're getting 277 statuses back, uh, we're providing that back to our clients, and that status of whether it was accepted by us and then by the payer is kept in a status tracking. And then when the remit comes in, and again, if we don't get an electronic remit, we don't know if that ever got paid. So that is something that we strongly encourage all of our clients to do is to get all of your remits electronically. And we do have the ability to get all the remits electronically, except I think we're having a little trouble with Buckeye these days, wherever Buckeye is, in terms of getting an electronic remit. Paramount. Okay, Paramount, we get. As far as I know, we do. At least at E-Tactics. So what about the claims that are pended at the MCO? We never know. You don't know necessarily where that claim is until it gets to you. Until it comes back. Yeah, I mean, if the, if the claim is there and it was accepted, but then never comes back, then we have to do some reporting that says accepted by this date and never paid. Now, again, if we don't get an electronic remit, I don't know if that was paid by paper. So that is something that is part of the workflow um, that needs to be part of the solution. So if we have an electronic remit, we track the claim history all the way through with every step of the way. But again, if I don't know that it came and got paid electronically, I don't know that that was paid. But I can help you look at your claims that were accepted and then never had any payment or additional status. Okay, uh, she wanted to ask the question of Qualifax or CareLogic. Basically, I think she wants to see all claims that were billed, anything that was paid, and anything without a response. Is that correct? Right, and therefore, uh, 
Correct. And um, actually, there wasn't a standard report in CareLogic that we could find that did that. Um, wow, that's a bad spot. Um, but however, our system admin actually built one in CareLogic so it can, and it was basically for council because council wants these numbers of what you build, what you haven't had a response, and what you got paid. So we had clients asking for it, so Josh created that. So, I mean, we have it. We can assist you with that. Um, I don't know if um, Todd can speak to any more specifics about – I did not see an existing report that did that. We looked. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of reports. I think a lot of times um, it's not exactly what somebody wants, and so that's why we – um, have a customer report writing service that supports that. In addition, we work with a lot of, of different billing um, billing organizations and clearing houses, um, and I think that's uh, all of them have sort of some unique uh, attributes and some unique differentiators. And that's another sort of challenge is, you know, ha given the fact that we're one EHR dealing with a lot of them, they all have sort of have different requirements and different needs. Is sort of the other complexity involved in that. Uh, but I'd say if you don't have something you need, we absolutely should be able to get that to you. I think it's just coming together on what those gaps are. Yeah. Um, just going back to the assessments, I just need a clarification. I'm sorry. You're going to have to speak up. Okay. Is that better? <coughs> okay. When you do the initial assessment, as long as you have all the um, needed information, you build that as an assessment, you have 30 days to do the comprehensive assessment, correct? And at that time, it's billed as individual counseling? Okay. That's all I needed. Thank you. Anybody want to answer that verbally, or are we good? That was a yes. Okay. It's pretty flexible. First counseling and then assessment. It's all the same thing. Logically, that doesn't sound yeah, right. Yeah. That's all my thought. Here. So you do get one assessment code that is in the benefit per calendar year. If you would choose to do that, but I don't know why you'd want to bill counseling first and then assessment. Because you're not, the only time I would think you would do that is if you were doing psych testing and there are now different codes for psych testing. Um, unfortunately, those psych testing codes don't pay very well, um, which is why you saw them on my list of things that need to be changed for po from a policy perspective. So again, I'm going to go back to saying, what service are you providing when you do that initial appointment? And if you're able to do counseling as part of that, and you choose to bill that first appointment as individual counseling, there's nothing in rule that says you can't do that. So it's really about what service did you provide? And I don't know, Sonda, if you wanna, if you have anything to add, this is kind of this whole question of do I always and forever have to bill a 90791? Yeah, um, sorry, ditto. No. Um, so I agree with saying that we have to think about the services that are provided and how to take care of these patients. And it just seems, again, logical to me that as they come in, you're sort of doing some sort of intake, some preparation on where they need to go and, and, and you know, who they need to see. That doesn't mean you cannot bill the individual counseling first. So if for some reason that's the service that occurred um, and some assessment is done during that, whatever, 60 minutes, let's say, if that code goes in before the 90791, you're not going to get it reject. Um, it's about the service and just describing the service when you send the bill. Does that make sense? And, but it's also, I think you've done a good job of saying this, is if you look at the rule, you have a period of time mm -hmm. until you have to comp have a treatment plan. And so the idea is, you've heard access, 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 right? The idea is you really need to look at how you're doing your therapeutic process of, of the assessment and this two-hour process or a four-hour process or, or what's preventing the person from seeing someone and, and getting some level of even triage. And that's why you have the ability, if this person's in distress, let's deal with the individual right now. And as a trained clinician, I'm going to utilize some of that as I'm putting together a treatment plan. And at one point along the way, I will bill for the, the assessment. But it can be more organic. It can be more of, of, of the actual engagement you'd have with the person. Stop worrying about the, 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 the compliance of it all. Um, use the flexibility that's there. That's what I keep hearing, um, at least in this particular
particular. There's, not, there's a lot of inflexibility too, don't get me wrong, but this process, <laughs> there's the ability to really look at how you engage the individual, which in the end is really what this is all about. And, and just to, to add to that, this is one of the most mind-blowing conversations that we ever have in what is available in BH Redesign. Um, it, it flies in the face of the legacy of the community you know, mental health and addiction treatment system. Going back to what we were ingrained in our brains, if you've been in the field for more than 10 years, you grew up in the McSys system where your board would not enter a client into the McSys registry for you to even build the first claim until you sent them an assessment code and sent them their address and verified where they lived and all of this other stuff. That's a thing of the past. We have to let go of that. The other point, and I think to, to Chris's point too, if you're starting to move down the road of same day access, which is a best practice, where you're getting that person in for therapy, you're getting them in for meds, you're getting them in, you have to be, you have to be more flexible in how you're billing and coding. Because if you bill those initial, you know, if you bill a 90791, you can't do same day access. Because, well, you can do it, but you won't get paid for anything other than the assessment. So it's also about what's the service model that you're using, and then what is that that's available to, to make sure that you're paid you know, properly for the services that you've provided. Because same-day access is something that if you've not looked at it and you're doing multiple services, I, I think it's something you have to. Again, back to access, back to patient care. Um, it is what is kind of being expected in terms of whole person, whole you know, client-centered, um, outcomes-focused care. Okay, I'm gonna come back in just one second. Um, Todd, does Qualifax have currently or in a product roadmap a predictive and prescriptive analytics engine. Wow. <laughs> Trust me, I had to read it three times to myself. <laughs> Here, here's what I would say. <clears throat> we have a, a data and analytics strategy at Qualifax that starts with the, a $2 million investment that we actually started this year um, that is in a new big data platform <clears throat> that sort of allows us to move away from what would be considered sort of traditional relational databases um, and gives us a lot more flexibility um, to aggregate data and provide um, de-identified benchmarking data, which we think will be more important for our clients. Um, phase two is really uh, to be started in 2000 and. Uh, 19, uh, we're having some of those conversations now uh, around data visualization and understanding how to make data more meaningful uh, in terms of taking action against it. I think the days of looking at tabular data sets and getting lost in that sea versus here's a simple graph that's a heat map that shows you exactly where the variability is or where the deviations are occurring, it doesn't give you the answer always as to why they're occurring, but it gives you an opportunity to look in the area that's most important is the second phase of our strategy that will begin to come to life in 2019. All of this, though, ultimately is get to what we want to do in 2020-ish, okay? So if you're thinking roadmap, these are directional things, guys. But there is a clear strategy that we are going to then take all that uh, insight, the benchmarking, the visualizations, and we're gonna drive that into decision support. And when we think about decision support as a technology company, it's not just clinical decision support, it's operational decision support. You're scheduling an appointment for somebody, I mean, this is just any, a use case, right? Seems silly, has huge implications. You're scheduling an appointment. You happen to want to schedule that appointment. You're free on Friday. But did you know that this consumer that you're getting ready to schedule this for has not showed up to one Friday appointment but shows up to all of their Monday appointments? That might be really helpful to know. And so I think taking the data and the digital exhaust of the big data platform, phase one, and driving that into insight for you to make better decisions is our strategy as a company. But that's a big question, that's a big answer. <laughs> okay, I have one more question, then I'm gonna go to you, then I'm gonna go to Tanisha. Um, this one, I'm, I'm just gonna make a statement, it may not thrill Todd, but um, one, of, one of the challenges I have with Qualifax is that um, you partner with Change, MDM. Uh, change is problematic. I'm just saying. So, 
Uh, we have a question because they were, as a CareLogic company was recommended to go with change, and they're only getting Molina and Medicaid. Well, guess what? Molina processes through change. So that makes sense. In, in my, and I've talked to Dana about this. You know, you don't have to be on an EHR and necessarily go with the integrated uh, clearinghouse that they use. You have a lot of options available to you. And, you know, I've been talking to Dana, and I haven't talked to Todd yet. I am now. I'm talking to him now. Um, right. I'm talking to him now. But, you know, I, I, I'd like to see Claim Remedy. I'd like to see eTactics be options for integrated in the end of the Qualifex system. Now, whether or not that's possible, you know, I, I fully understand why you're getting Molina because they're on change. I've been, on, I've been communicating with Emily Higgins from Molina because her registrations for 835s are taking 45 days through any other clearinghouse, so. Hey, Ray, do you have any time after the conference for you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and also, but to be really clear, yeah. we don't require organizations. Well, somebody recommended is what they said. That's right, but they, words. we have I plenty of agencies that yeah. use claim remedy right. or right. whatever Did clearinghouse that they, we, do, we are integrated with change from years ago when they were Endion, and that's right. kind of partnership that's stayed intact, but if you feel like you're a Qualifax customer and you're being forced to utilize change healthcare, that's not the truth. There are lots of options, and Teresa's, you know, proof on the pudding that there are lots of options that would work for any of our customers. Absolutely none of my clients. They can't hear you in the back. So... Yeah, I, so I think just to clarify Dana's point and, and to uh, maybe answer more directly, Teresa, your question, we do have a relationship with Change. We, we have lots of, of customers, candidly, who use other clearinghouses. Uh, we are happy to work with any one of our clients to move to the clearinghouses of their choice uh, to make sure that that works for their business. Um, and I would only uh, add the comment that um, that does not mean that in the future we won't have uh, more potential partnerships with other clearinghouses. Um, I think if you look at us as an organization, another component of our strategy is making sure that we have a, a marketplace, if you will, of, of an ecosystem of other technology partners and service providers that help provide for more of the solution because um, none of us can do this alone. So I don't mean to sound redundant, but it goes back to the assessment slash individual. <laughs> is that person, let's listen for a second, is that person permitted to start groups after perhaps an individual that looks like an assessment, but if they came in today and they needed a, an assessment, but I don't do an assessment, I do an individual, can I schedule them for a group that evening? I, I don't think there's a rule about that in particular, yeah. So we can't build two services that same day. Is that... Is that does this one work? Or can you bill for a group without the assessment? Okay, so let me clarify again. Okay. Clinically, you absolutely, whatever is your first appointment, you are doing an assessment. What you bill that is as, it, it depends on how you've structured your services and what is the full and, and complete type of service you provided. You've done an assessment, you have a diagnosis. If you, in your treatment, your initial treatment plan, put that they are going to be attending an anger management group, you have authorized the service. Even though it wasn't the same day. It can be the same day. You have an assess, you, now, that, now that's a different question because now you're getting into how do the NCCI edits work because there are edits around group and, and individual psychotherapy. And I know Sonda's gonna talk about that this afternoon. So that's a different question. So again, I wanna be very, very crystal clear. Teresa Lample is saying clinically, <laughs> you shall do and should clinically always do an assessment at the first visit. There are lots of ways people come into care. A crisis intervention is an assessment. I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna bring up this issue and I can't even believe them. This is another legacy issue. Opening and closing cases. There's no rule that requires an open and closed case. You do admissions and you do discharges. 
The old ODATIS rule of you have to close a case within 30 days, it does not, no longer exists. It is now part of our legend and lore. We have to undo our old tapes, to use a clinical term. You gotta turn off the old tapes and create the new method that you're putting in your own brain. Use your behaviorist, your, your motivational interviewing, use your, your cognitive behavioral therapy skills and apply them to how we're practicing because that's essentially what we're doing. We're getting rid of old tapes and looking at what did we do and how can we code that and what did we put on the treatment plan. And an initial treatment plan and an ongoing treatment plan, these are not static things. We've treated them as static things. And, and real quick, I think the other way to, th to think about it is the, you, the assessment that a clinician, that a trained clinician does, doesn't happen because they've billed for it. It's happened because they're a trained clinician. When you said this person is going into group, I've seen them and they're going into group, I'm assuming that means the trained clinician has talked to this individual and said, this person could benefit from this group. You just assess them. Now, again, down the road in the paperwork and what you put in the client record and eventually getting a more thorough you know, documentation of that assessment, but I think what everyone's trying to say is that the, the world today is that as a clinician, someone coming to you for care who could benefit from something you have going on that day, if a trained clinician is able to engage with the, the person and says they could, they could benefit from this service, then you can do that. And you don't have to build it as assessment. You, anyway, we won't get into that. Okay, we're gonna, oh, go ahead. I, I think the other piece to that that's imperative when an MCO or an auditor comes in is going to look at that, did you explain it in that progress note? You know, you, you've got to write it down. If, if you explain that, you know, the client came in for this reason, we assessed them, these services were available and needed immediately, if that's written down, that's, that's where it's meaningful, that's where it's going to make a difference to them and to somebody who's coming in to say, what's driving this treatment? You write it down. Okay, we are going to take two more questions. We are running over. I'm getting into Sonda's time, and her, her time is really a good time. So um, let me go back here. <laughs> okay, these are very quick. So we are SUD residential, so we do not offer mental health, so we get an outside agency. So that's where we get whoever bills first gets paid. So can we use that XE modifier? Because like you said, audits, edits, and limits says you can't bill on the same day, but the rule says you can. So how would we get paid for our services? You can't. Did <laughs> you say you can't? You can. <laughs> you can't, basically, no. right? An XE modifier does not apply for an SUD residential, okay? That would be like... A, an XE modifier, Sonda made this very clear to me. I, I had her talk to me like I didn't know anything about it. And she did. She was very nice. She said, you get a group and you get psychotherapy the same day. That psychotherapy isn't going to pay. Okay? And, and trust me, Medicaid will always pay that group, that 2163 okay? But then they'll leave that, you know, $250 psychotherapy unpaid. That's where an XE modifier works. Okay. They only work with CPT codes. CPT, mm -hmm. right. Okay. Not residential. Se second question? Yeah, but no, the second question would be on the prior authorizations where they get two um, per, you know, per calendar year. Is there any way you can notate that that's their second 30 if they've had a break in coverage? You know, because I know I talked to you earlier, Teresa, on that. Um, and s because we will get denials because we've had a break in coverage, because they went to the hospital or, you know, other circumstances. Is there any way that we can notate that when we bill that without getting a denial? So how that break in coverage, if you've got just a short time and depending on where your claims are, I mean, it's claims based. So the best way to do that would be to pick up the phone and notify the managed care plan that's authorizing the service to talk to you um, the patient's uh, case manager, and if they don't have a case manager, they should have. So making sure that they're enrolled in that case management program or notifying the prior authorization department within the managed care plan so that they have that information that you've done a, you know, that there's been a break in coverage, whether that's an administrative discharge because, you know, they've 
um, maybe they relapsed and now they're in an inpatient unit or there were criminal justice charges or there was a family emergency that required them to leave care for several days, whatever the circumstance. So that there has to be a notification to the plan though to know, otherwise they're thinking it's continuous coverage because there's always gonna be a delay in claims payment and the only way the plans have of knowing how to count those 30 days is claims payment. So if you've not told them, and let's say the break happens on day 20, they're assuming that they're marching right along until they don't get claims. Um, while we're talking about uh, strategic management, and you talked about moderniz modernization of the codes to a universal set, does this conversation apply to private insurances? I can answer that. So, private insurance, private carriers is a whole nother ball game. Trust me, because I had what thirty years of dealing with private behavioral health, and then when I came over to the agencies, obviously it was quite a shock to my system, and I'm still rehabbing. But um, it, it, it's it, there is a lot of differences. For example, a private carrier pr will typically not, I don't want to say never, pay for case management and Q, uh, CPST. These are things that on the private side we've not dealt with that have been traditionally provided through an agency. So you're, the codes that Ohio Behavioral Health Redesign have um, migrated to is what uh, the private insurers have looked at all the time, the CPT codes. Uh, we do, we rarely deal with the age codes, but there are some occasions. But in general, uh, you are still, as an agency, being paid uh, for services that private insurers do not pay for. So if that helps. And yeah, they're the same. Right. Okay, and I think I, I didn't want to say the assessment part because I think uh, Teresa might jump on my whole head. <laughs> but... <laughs> That's where the conversation came when we were talking about the assessment part and will that model apply once we start to apply for private insurances? It, it's the exact same thought process. Okay. It's CPT code wording. Yeah. CPT coding. Right. Yeah, so basically, you, we've entered into a new world. <laughs> we've entered into a new world where we have to rethink. You know, I mean, They've said it a number of different ways, but basically the hick picks are gone except for the silly ones. So, well, uh, Teresa has asked me to come down and jump on you. <laughs> so, no, I'm just I'm kidding. She didn't say that. But in general, I, I, the way we have been answering the questions for the agency would be the same way I would answer it on a commercial private level. Exactly. And I think that just for other providers, I think the ultimate <laughs> message is that we have to go back and train our clinicians in this way, you know. So I think even though we're here for a billing uh, well, information, well, I well I am. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I'm here for. <laughs> I mean, w one thing that I've been telling agencies is, you know, this is a time to really look at your clinical workflow, and what do you need to do to better provide better access to care, provide better care to get reimbursed more. That sounds strategic to me. It does, doesn't it? And um, just so you know, what, we didn't get to a few questions. We, get, we will get answers, and somebody would like a list of your customers in Ohio. So just wanted to share that. But thank you so much to everybody for participating Can I in this. get in one last thing here? Oh, sure. And this is just, this is self-serving, of course. But... Um, when I first started working with agencies, I would go in and I would have the talk about this changing your workflow or your operations to meet the new guidelines. And so far in that time period, I'd say the first three months, I was a three-headed monster. I've gone down to only one, and I'm pretty happy about that. <laughs> Thank you really to everyone. Thank you very much.